Thank you very much, my friends. That's nice of you. Welcome to To Tell the Truth, and I would like you to take a look at a very sensitive plant. This is a terribly sensitive plant. Look what happens to it when we play, for instance, a little rock music. Can I have some rock music, please? It died. We have wounded its feelings. Let, 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 let's try a little Bach this time. See what happens if we play Bach. A little Bach. A little, a little Bach slower. Here we go, a little Bach. See? It revived its spirit. It just goes to show you what rock does to plants and what Bach does to plants. And of course, it's all a fake. I got a big string on the end here. That's what happened. <laughs> but actually, I'm kidding, but our next guest isn't. She really claims that rock music is bad for plants, while classical mu uh, Bach does wonders for them. We'll hear more about that right after we meet our panel here on To Tell the Truth. Bill Pollock. Peggy Pat. Okay, panel happy Friday, upward, onward, chins up, and here we go. Let us meet now the lady who plays music for plants. What is your name, please? My name is Dorothy Retallick. Number two. My name is Dorothy Retallick. Number three. My name is Dorothy Retallick. All right, now finally you're gonna have to find out which one of these ladies is indeed Dorothy Retallick, and here is a pretty fascinating story. I, Dorothy Retallick, have come to believe that potted plants prefer Bach to rock. This discovery took place in a biology laboratory where I was given the assignment of determining the reaction of plants to various kinds of music. I bought some packets of seeds for corn, radishes, beans, as well as zinnias, marigolds, and geraniums. I grew them in plastic cups, and when they were big enough, I put a group of the cups in controlled environment chambers equipped with loudspeakers. The plants that listened to Bach and Johann Strauss and Montavani thrived and bloomed. But when the sound of Led Zeppelin and vanilla fudge rang out, squash shriveled and daisies drooped. I can't help but wonder if there is a lesson here for human beings. <laughs> Signed, Dorothy Retallick. And we will delve deeper into this uh, mysterious matter in just a moment after a few outspoken words. Now remember that all three of these ladies claim to be Dorothy Retallick, who rocks and box plants. I will start the question with a lady whose voice would make a cactus bloom. Peggy <laughs> Cass. Hey, well, remember when I happen to have a lot of plants, and I have six speakers in my house, and rock goes in my house from morning till night, and my plants... Everything does beautifully. My African violets, my palm trees, my jade plants, my begonias, my wandering Jew, my spider ivy, and my pickaback. However, my English ivy doesn't do well. Number one, what do you, what do you think this is due? I think that this is probably due to the fact that uh, the wave vibrations coming from those particular plants that you have, like rock. But but most thinking, plants don't. Well, I, my dear, I, I mean, I really have a green thumb, except for the English ivy, and I think I'll p play Joe Cocker for it tomorrow morning and see if it picks up a bit. <laughs> uh, number three, uh, why, I, why, I'm really worried about my English ivy. It's turning yellow, and it's in the sun, and it says you should put it in the sun. The ivy and the types of plants have nothing to do with the reaction that you're describing. What we are describing here is a controlled experiment and plants were subjected to music under control conditions. I would imagine your English ivy is fading for other reasons. Oh, good. Well, then, then number music. two, rock music works, then, for my plants. Like you don't water it or something like that. <laughs> no, I water it. It's just a rock plant. <laughs> number two, 
Do your plants swing, I mean, when you play wild music, or are they just... No, grew? well, you, know, you see, they're grown in a controlled environment, yeah. and uh, I haven't noticed any swinging, but I can tell you that when I play hymns and devotional music, it has a decided effect on them. The morning glory uh, at one time tried to twine itself around the speaker. <laughs> really? That's I've scary. never met a sexy morning glory before. <laughs> That's a religious yeah. morning glory. Oh, I beg your pardon there, morning glory. <laughs> Uh, number three, you got any idea what photosynthesis is? Uh, that is a botanical term. Yes. Uh, actually, um... Okay, number three, thank you. Uh, number one, do you talk to your plants? Yes, a little bit. And do they respond? I mean, do they, do they react in any way? I really don't know, because, um... I mean, all right, Jean, as far as we can go there, let's go on to Kitty. Number two, are you a biologist? No, I'm not. I only got interested because I wanted to get my degree from college after, after about 25 years. Um, and you got into this program through trying to get I, a degree? I find I had to have biology, and my 18-year-old son plays rock music so loud. Thank you. <laughs> Number three, are you a biologist? No, I'm not. How did you get into uh, it? This was a required course for a degree. And it was a, you had the same problem. Uh, number two, uh, did you ever hear about two cornfields under controlled circumstances, one that had the music played and one that didn't, and the one that had the music grew faster and better? Yes, I've heard of that, and I've heard of experiments that uh, I believe in California about 15 years ago that Dr. Franklin Law did, which was the effect of prayer on plants, too. I see. And number three, number three, thank you. Do you believe in I'm sorry, Kitty, we're going to skip down to the end, then here we go to Bill Cullen. Hey there. Hmm? Hey, Bill. Numbers one, two, and three. <laughs> are you putting us on? <laughs> Number one, are you putting us on? No. I do not belittle what you say, but I just, if you're putting us on, I think we ought to know, number one. And you're swore to tell the truth, you know. I swore to tell the truth, and I'm telling the truth after nearly three years of experiment. Number two. There's, there's a... <laughs> There's a scientific name in biology or in plant life, and I imagine you encountered it in getting that degree, uh, a scientific name for the English phrase production in light. Would you know what that scientific uh, name is? No, I don't. I know how I grow my plants, which is by <laughs> grow lux, but I don't know the scientific name. Grow lux? Mm -hmm. That's the light we I, use. May I say a word about Vigoro here, which <laughs> certainly That's is... The like, Does, it's an Italian opera, and that's all the time, my friends, that we have for questioning at this time. Certainly. They, they like Italian opera music. Uh, uh, on bigger uh, I I hope we I must know. vote. And we vote either for number one, or for number two, or for number three. We pay $50 for each bad vote. We pay $500 if none of the votes is good. And Peggy starts. I can't believe that a plant that would grow for Bach would grow equally well for Montevani, and that's why that's I don't right. believe it. I mean... The band, that's the thing to play the flowers. The band, Credence Clearwater, number one. So, there you go. You're voting for number one. And a belligerent number one. Now we go to uh, Jean, please. Well, I'm, I'm going to vote for number three. She had some idea of what photosynthesis was. How do you know? She didn't tell you. Well, she had a gleam in her eye. <laughs> so, a vote for the gleam in the eye of number three, and that takes us to Kitty. I'm voting for the gleam in the eye of number three, too. <laughs> so, three for three and one for one, and Bill Cullen, they're not putting you on. Somebody believes it. Well, I didn't have much faith in this, but years ago, when I was single, I had a pansy which grew profusely what? to Percy Granger's country garden. They've been known to do that. And for that reason, I voted for number one. You liar. Had to do with photosynthesis, too, which means taking a picture of plastic. That's <laughs> the votes are split all over the place. We're going to find out about this. Will the real Dorothy Retallick please stand up? Number two stands up. It's the end. No. Thank you, Dorothy. We'll be back to you in just a moment. Let's check out our imposters. Charming number two, what is your real name? What do you do? My name is Eugenia Rawls, and I do talking books for the blind. <laughs> Very demanding work. Number three, you got two wrong votes. What is your real name? What do you do, please? My real name is Dorothy Culver, and I'm the placement director of the Katherine Gibbs School. <laughs> Now, 
Now, Dorothy Retallick, the real one, I don't think that you got a chance to answer Peggy's question. Why, why, why don't her plants? My plants do, except for that English ivy. Have you got an answer for that? It, Other... ju it just must be your charming personality, because yep. you talk to them. Yeah, that's true. My that does it. I talk to them. You get up in the morning and talk to your flowers? Yes, I uh, yell at them and I spank them and I talk to them a lot. Why don't you grow, thing. you dummy? <laughs> <laughs> it's been nice learning about this. And thank you very much, Dorothy Retallick and Imposters, for being with us on To Tell the Truth. Now, here again, we come to a truly abrupt change of pace. Twenty-five years ago, our next guest pressed a button, and the world has not been the same since. We'll hear more from him in just a moment. 1118, that's 1-800-962-1118. And now let's meet a man who pressed a button and shook the world. Number one, what is your name, please? My name is Thomas Farabee. Number two. My name is Thomas Farabee. Number three. My name is Thomas Farabee. Hmm. Okay, here is Thomas Farabee's astounding affidavit. It goes as follows. I, Thomas Farabee, was the bombardier who released the atomic bomb that destroyed the city of Hiroshima, Japan. The exact time was 8.15 a.m., August 6, 1945. The name of our specially built B-29 was the Enola Gay. Only the pilot had been briefed on the deadly payload we were carrying, and it wasn't until we landed that I learned just how important and deadly the mission had been. Although convinced that dropping the atomic bomb actually saved many lives by hastening the end of the war, I hope and pray that all nations have enough sense never to use the dreaded bomb again. Signed, Thomas Ferrevy. As I said, this is a change of pace. Bill Cullen, you want to go? Yeah, number two, where did you receive your training? At uh, Albuquerque, New Mexico. Uh, uh, your training for your, your commission in the Air Force, which was called in number two? That's true. Uh, number one, when you, when you first went into, did you also, where did you receive your training, number one? Kaitland, Albuquerque, New Mexico. And you were a, eventually a bombardier. Did you start out training to be a bombardier, number one? Yes, sir. Number three, did you begin training to be a bombardier? No, I spent uh, four months in pilot training, and then I went back and went to bombardier. Uh, number two, there's, uh, there's an airplane that was a, a great fighter plane, has the engine mounted behind the pilot, and the, the drive shaft to the propeller goes right under his lap. Do you know what airplane that is? Very famous World War II airplane, a fighter. Be escort for a bomber as opposed to a bomber. Uh, that was a P-38. Uh, number three, uh, what, what was the configuration of the uh, B-17? Was that a tricycle gear or was that conventional tail-down gear? That's conventional tail-down gear. I beg pardon, sir? Conventional tail-down. Right. Wow, tough questions. Bill's a flyer. Let's go to Peggy. Number two, what was the Enola Gay named after? It was Lieutenant Colonel Paul Tibbetts' mother. Thank you. Uh, number three, do you think that the American command had any idea what that bomb was going to do when they dropped it? Oh, uh, yes, I do. You think they knew exactly how much firepower was in it? Yes. Hey, number one, did the American uh, uh, bombers in the, uh, destroy any city as much as Hiroshima during World War II, do you know? Yes, ma'am. What city was that? Dresden. Thank you very much. Uh, number three, how many raids were led on Japan, not counting the Doolittle raids, before the Hiroshima raid? I don't know the exact number. There were hundreds. Oh, uh, there were? Sure. Oh. Uh, now, number two, uh, was it we bombed another city in Japan and heard it just as badly as Hiroshima, didn't we? Yes, we did. What was that one? Nagasaki. Thank you. Uh, number one, how many bombs have we got left over now that we could drop if we wanted to? Oh, I don't have any idea, ma'am. Oh, well, I mean, like one a city? I mean, have we got a lot, so just little? I mean, I have no idea either. I just am curious. Or is that classified? We have a stockpile. I don't know how many. Uh, number two, the new bombs, the high... Thank you, Peggy, and it takes us to Gene Rayburn. Number three, to a bombardier, what do the uh, letters of the alphabet C-E mean? Circular air. 
Number two, do you have any idea where Concho Field is? No, I don't. Number one, what kind of bomb site did you have on the 29? The Norton. Number three, who makes a, who made another bomb site during World War II? Sperry. Number two, what kind of autopilot did you use on the 29? I'm not quite sure. Number one, uh, where did you go to school again? I went in Kirtland Air Force, Kirtland Air Base, in Albuquerque, New Mexico. Yeah. Well, name another bombardier school in Texas. Uh, Big Springs, uh, Kelly Field. Thank you. Uh, number three, who is flying the plane at the instant of release of a bomb? Uh, you know, on this mission? Yes. Uh, the bombardier. Number two, what is speed of closure? Let's see. I was a B-29 bombardier during the war. <laughs> I don't know something about that. Well, that sounds what, what is speed of closure? Oh, you find All it. right, they buzz just in time for you, Kitty. Let's go. <laughs> Number two, what was your rank and how old were you at the time of the mission? Major. Approximately 24. Thank you. Uh, number one, what have you been doing since? I'm still in the Air Force, ma'am. And number three, how did you, well, how did they tell you when you returned from the mission what you had done? As well as I remember, uh, General Spots asked me, uh, what did the first atomic bomb look like? And what did you say? I said it was uh, about what we predicted, that uh, from what we could see, the whole city was gone. And that's when you found out it was an atomic bomb? Yes. Number two, what was your reaction at that point? Well, I didn't really have any real reaction because I didn't realize what had happened. I wasn't briefed on the tremendous explosion that would take place. And number one, how long were you in the Air Force after that? I'm still in the Air Force. Oh, that's right. Number three, and you? I'm still in the Air Force. You're still in the Air Force? Yes. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Kitty, and that does it. And we must now make up our minds. This one's going to be tough. Is it number one? Or do you think it's number two? Or is it perhaps number three? In any event, it's $50 that we pay for each wrong vote. $500 of all the votes are wrong. And, Bill, you go, my friend. Gee, I'll tell you, they all answer. They all... The two of them are very well briefed. Do you agree, Gene? Yes, indeed. Two of them two are of them extremely, really extremely well briefed. Stuff. And I can't see if that's a bomb above the wings, but uh, is that a bomb in there? What is that in there? Yeah, they bombardier wings. Are bombardier wings. Uh, number one, is that a bomb? Oh, I'm not allowed to do that. No, yes, you're not that's allowed right. to Everybody's marked their ballots. We yeah, can't see their minds. It's a command wing, anyway. Oh, I, I voted for number three. They were all great. It could have been anybody. One tentative vote for number three. Yeah, I was going to vote for number one because, of, because Dresden was bombed. That's the worst bombed city of World War II. But the thing is, I couldn't figure out where that place was. He was in New Mexico. I never heard of Albuquerque, New Mexico. I mean, I didn't, so I couldn't vote for it. So I voted for three because, well, he talks to generals well, and everything. Peggy, where are you from? Boston. Whoever heard of Boston? There's no place <laughs> named Boston. <laughs> The rest of the country calls it Boston. Let's, let's go, go to Gene, please. Well, as you indicated, Gary, it's a tough choice. Number one, did know that there was a bombardier school at Big Spring and other things. Uh, uh, I went for number three. He knew a lot of the technical one. stuff. I'm okay, you. it's three and three and three. And what's Kitty well, going to do? I'm so ignorant that I thought that number three knew everything and the others didn't know anything, so I voted for number three. <laughs> Well, for the second time this week, we have gone way out on a limb. Everybody has placed their votes on the same man. The last time you were correct. Let's see how you come out this time. Will the real Colonel Thomas Faraday please stand up? Colonel, we'll be back to you in just a moment. Let's get number one, uh, sir. What is your real name and what do you do? My name is Don Collins. I'm a retired... E <laughs> what does that mean? <laughs> I'm, a re I'm a retired New York City detective and I'm a narcotic consultant to the Queens District Attorney. And you know, you know I him. get him one. Oh, sure. <laughs> I, ha I hate to ask you under what circumstances. <laughs> but well, we... Being on the narcotic squad and all like that, you know. <laughs> I did. I met him once. I met you once about four years ago at a restaurant. <laughs> Is that something? But how would I know he was that Seuss? <laughs> <laughs> he was the maitre d' at the time. <laughs> Number two, what is your name, sir, and what do you do? My name is Bill Roth, 
secretary of the first tournament committee for the Bahama Islands Open Golf Tournament to be held in December, and director of golf of Bahama Reef Country Club, Freeport, Grand Bahama. Great. <laughs> Colonel Farabee, I'm sure a question that you're frequently asked is, have, did you ever return to Hiroshima or Hiroshima, uh, however you prefer to pronounce it? Yes. Uh, a few of us went up there immediately when uh, the war was over after we signed the treaty. And we did fly over a low level over Hiroshima and we landed at Nagasaki and spent the night there, but uh, I was never on the ground at Hiroshima. Have you ever had any guilt feelings at all about dropping the bomb? No, uh, I have not. Uh -huh. uh, could you have, in fact, if you had so felt, could you have honorably refused to, to, to fly the mission had you so felt? We understand that you didn't know what the mission was about, but well, let's assume that you do. Could you have said, I won't do it? I could have said, I won't do it. I don't think it had been very honorably. Well, that's a good answer. Thank you very much, Colonel Farabee, for being with us. Thank you, imposters, on behalf of To Tell the Truth. Two things I want to do before we call it a week. I want to thank our production staff for a marvelous bunch of material to work with this week. Yeah. They've given us a great yeah. week, yeah, yeah, for the staff. Yeah, good, Nifty job. And you wear nice suits, too. And Gene Rayburn, yeah. what a what? joy to have you with us. And you are coming back next week, right? Yes, I will be glad Gene to Gene Rayburn thank will be with us next thank week. You. And I am glad. We will see you, thank you, gentlemen. Traveling on business or traveling for fun, it's good to know you're on American Airlines. This is Johnny Olson speaking for To Tell the Truth, a Mark Goodson, Bill Totman production. Now, stay tuned for What's My Line with Larry Blyden next on Game Show Network, America's favorite place to watch, play, and win.